So 2 Timothy, as we're making our way through this book, very slowly, but that's my intention on Sunday mornings, just to go more in depth through the Bible, not so much overview of the Bible. But when Paul wrote this letter, Timothy, this is actually his last letter, it was a very bad time for Christianity. And even though the gospel was literally spreading over the whole known world, thousands were coming to Christ. But because Christianity is the truth, Satan was also working to destroy what Jesus died for. And so there was all kinds of things, well I should say three main things that were coming against the church or against the believer. One was the fear of persecution. Literally, if you were a Christian in this day, you would have the fear of being killed for your faith. It was a very real thing. Second one was bad theology. Lies that have crept into the church, false doctrines, and what a false doctrine does that actually gets your eyes off of Jesus and onto something else. And there were false doctrines, but also... The one I think that America falls prey to is pleasure. Things in this world designed to get your attention off of God and upon things. And it's very easy to do because we like pleasure. We like to do fun things. But just as it's true today, it was so true in this time. And so Paul was encouraging Timothy. Paul's wanted all the church to stay in the faith, but how much more did he want his own church? Um, son in the faith. Timothy was his disciple. He raised Timothy. He wanted to make sure that Timothy wasn't going to depart. But don't think as we study this epistle that it's just for Timothy. <laughs> we can actually apply these things to our life as well. In fact, um, I'm not sure if you knew this, but First and Second Timothy and also Titus are known as the pastoral epistles. They are letters to a pastor, from a pastor to a pastor. And so these become kind of like the outline of how a pastor should be and also for church order. Um, but let's go ahead and pick up as we are in verse 15 of chapter 2. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And Paul says to Timothy, Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly explains the word of truth. Now, Paul is not telling Timothy that he needs to work for his salvation. This isn't a command to be a better Christian. We need to understand this doctrine that in Christ all sin is dealt with. We are made new, we are made perfect in Christ. And so you can't add to perfection. You can't grow in perfection. You're perfect. So there is, Paul's not saying work so you can be, you know, a better Christian or more perfect. Paul here is telling Timothy to be diligent to study the truth, to take time to look into scripture and look into the teaching of the apostles. Be committed to that. Study the word of God. More than anything else out there, Timothy, you are to study the word of God. You are to rightly divide the word of God, as we're going to see in chapter 3. You need to make time to devote to the word of God. And guys, there's a reason for this. Men and women are different. And I'm going to just kind of touch on each one. Not only because the Bible says that men and women are different, and that would be enough for me, but then even nature reveals that men and women are different. And I'm going to speak generally here because you always have the exception. You know, you always have, you know, the woman who has kind of guy tendencies. And then you have the guy that has more feminine tendencies. And that's the exception. And we probably all know someone like that. But generally speaking, men are far different than women. And nature says that. But God also says that. And that's enough for me, as I've said. But a woman, they have more of a tendency to be deceived. Now, hear me out before you stone me, women. They are more apt to believe what someone is telling them. And this is true. Salesmen would rather go talk with a woman of the home than with the man of the home. Because they know a woman is more open to listen and more, off, more open to be sold. And even from a scriptural standpoint, Eve was deceived in the garden. And actually, Paul makes reference to that in 1 Timothy. He says, let not a woman be, have authority over a man. Let not a woman be a teacher over a man. Because Eve was deceived. And there is more apt for a woman to be deceived. Scripture teaches that. God teaches that. And that's what we have to hold to. And we can, if you're a logical person, you should be able to see that. 
So in the teaching of the word, what can happen as far as from a woman's standpoint is they can take whatever comes from the pulpit as truth. You know, oh, Charlie said that, so it must be true. I can't tell you how many times my wife, she likes to read Facebook articles, and certain pastors post Facebook articles, and she reads the article, and she says, wow, he was pretty convincing. I almost like believe what he says. Why do we believe this way again? She's asking me because she just read it, and it, the way something's presented, it's very convincing. It's very, of course they're going to tell you their side. Of course they're going to show it from there, and women have a tendency to want to believe the best in people. They want to hear and believe what someone is saying to them. And this is generally speaking. I know that's not true in every case. But men, on the other hand, have deal with something far worse than deception. Because you see, even though de being deceived is bad, you can bring a deceived person back by reason. You know, if you hear something and you say, oh yeah, it sounded really good, I, I like that, but you can go to them and say, well, here's what the scripture says, and you can reason them back. Men struggle with pride. And pride it is far worse because pride is really the root of sin. The cause of all sin is centered in pride. And pride at its core is self. What I want, what I think, I am the best, I am cool, I can beat up anyone, I know the most, I know everything, I know all the secrets, and if there's something I can't do, that's stupid. <laughs> Personally, I am the best. <laughs> pride. Men throughout history have this competitive nature that has caused the death of millions of people in war. And all war can be traced back to the pride of man, wanting to be the greatest, having all the answers, thinking that somehow they are the object of creation. And I guarantee we all know a guy that's like that. That every, whatever I say is the, what goes. And it doesn't matter what anyone else says. Now, Concerning the word of God, how does the pride of man affect the study of scripture? Because we're no longer learners and we become prey to our own ideas and reason. And the truth is, is there is no room in Christianity for pride. In fact, the Bible says that God resists the proud. He resists the proud man. One of the seven things that God hates, he says there are seven things that God absolutely hates. You know what one of them is? pride. That I know everything. I've arrived. I am the greatest. God hates that. That whole attitude is detestable to God. There's an old maxim that says, he who doesn't know, and he knows that he doesn't know, he's a student. Teach him. But there's one who knows the truth, and yet he knows that he knows the truth. That is a teacher, and he should teach him. But there is one who thinks that he knows, but he doesn't know. That's a fool. Shun him. And there are quite a few men like that out there that think they know, but they really don't know. And they become a fool. And this is a very tragic and horrible thing, how many men refuse to learn the truth of God because of their own pride. And you see, pride at its nature is blinding, so they don't even know that they're wrong. I have to work a full-time job right now. I work for True Green, and I work in, in trees and shrubs, horticulture, and I, and I not only deal with them as a job, I, I've learned and I've taken classes and training, not only in identifying trees, but also identifying diseases. But I went and showed up at a property, and she had some spruce trees. And to be very specific, they were the Colorado blue spruce trees. And the needles were turning red on there, which is a sign of a disease called rhizotheria, or the common name is needle cast. And I communicated this information to this woman. Later on, she communicated this information to her son, who claimed to work in trees and shrubs. He probably pruned them. Because he told her that they were not spruce trees, that they were pine trees. And that the reason why the needles are turning red was not from the disease, was from the lack of sun. Now, when I heard that information, I went to them and I said, him, that's wrong. <laughs> Those are spruce trees, not pine trees. 
and they are actually Colorado blue spruce, and that there is a sign of the disease. No, those are pine trees. I used to work in trees and shrubs. I couldn't reason with him. So what do I have to do when you can't reason? You have to walk away, and that's exactly what I had to do. He wants to be ignorant. He can be ignorant. But you see, that's what pride, that's how it looks. You could tell, you might know the truth, you might present the truth, but he's never going to realize it because he's sure of something that he knows nothing really about. And how many men do we know like that? <laughs> Guys, men, we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. We are to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Learners. There's a reason that Jesus didn't pick Pharisees as his 12 disciples. Pharisees would have been the better choice from a logical standpoint. They were ones who studied the scripture their whole life. But he's picking men to give the truth of God to. He doesn't pick those who are well-educated older men. He takes fishermen, young boys. And why does he take young boys fishermen? Because he can teach them. Because they did not have this proud look, so to speak. They could be taught. Guys, a disciple means we are to learn. And as men, we have to fight this pride. I personally have talked with many Bible teachers and pastors from different denominations. And even though I know that they're wrong, I listen to them. And I hear them out. And then I ask the reason for why they believe what they believe. And I want to know what verses they're using to support their belief. But this is true. In almost all cases, 95, I'd say, 90-95% of the time, when I question their doctrine with other scripture, when I say, well, what about these verses that support against it? They get upset and they shut off. Now, if they were truly disciples and learners, why would they shut off and get angry the moment that they're questioned? Because of pride. That's what pride does. Don't question me. Don't touch me. Don't prove me wrong. There was a guy that I was talking with. He didn't believe in hell. He said, Jesus, there's no such thing as hell. And I would point him to Scripture. He said, no. And I met people who had issues with me because I was a 20-year-old kid or 22, 23-year-old kid. And I was talking Scripture with people that were much older than me and had their degrees. And they would use the excuses, you're just a kid, you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, that's okay, because I guarantee the Pharisees thought the same thing about Jesus. Because Jesus was a 30-year-old man teaching the very truth of God. In fact, when he was 12 years old, he was teaching the truth of God in the temple, if you know your Bible. And they couldn't resist the wisdom he spoke. Guys, we're responsible, men and women, we are responsible for knowing the Scripture and to do so, we have to work hard. We have to be diligent. We have to take the time to study the Scripture. And I, I, that's why I love Calvary Chapel. We study the Scripture verse by verse. We go through the Bible. But, it, you know, what's so mind-blowing is how much time people will put into themselves. I don't know if you know this, but I work out. I've been working out for 14 years. And I did the math. This is a product of 14 years, five hours a week. That comes out to 4,368 hours. That is 182 complete days at the gym. <laughs> I know it's a waste of time. <laughs> It, I like what the scripture says. Bodily exercise profits some. And there is a profit to it. I mean, I can pick up heavy things. <laughs> I can move things around. <laughs> but guys, it only profits me in this life. And maybe not even all my life. Because I guarantee when I'm 60, 70 years old, I'm not going to have the strength as I do now. And yet I put so much time into myself. And we all do in some way, some other form. But how much more should we be putting ourselves or investing into ourselves the study of Scripture, the things that pertain to godliness? Because you see, what happens to me 
in the next life is directly related to how I know God's word today. Because the more we know God's word, the more we're going to know who God is because God is revealed through his word. Jesus told that to the Pharisees. You search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but they actually are testifying of me. You want to know what God is like, you're not going to find it in meditation. You're not going to be able to go into a trance and find out who God is. You want to know who God is, you've got to study the scripture because that is the revealing of God right there. And he gave us his word. And there's such a confidence that comes with knowing God's word. I know what the Bible teaches. And I'm confident in that. Question me on doctrine. Question me on my beliefs. And I know what the scripture teaches on my beliefs. Yes, there are things that the Bible is silent on, and then I'm going to be silent on the issue. If the Bible doesn't say something on there, how can I say this is the truth? You just have to have an opinion, and it's okay to have an opinion, but there are certain truths that are not opinions. They are facts because they're in the Word of God. We must all know the Word, and we must be able to then take the Word and be able to communicate that to others. And that is why we study the Bible at Calvary Chapel, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And, you know, technically I'm doing a topical today. I mean, we go through the Bible, but much shorter. But on Wednesday nights, we go through the Bible. We've started in Genesis. We've been here for a little over two years. We started in Genesis, and now we're into Joshua. And ask Chad. He's been here from Genesis all the way up into Joshua. We're going straight through the Bible. He keeps on saying, I can't wait till we get the Song of Solomon. (laughs) 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 Yeah, we're going to go through Song of Solomon too when we're there. We, it's our responsibility to know God's word, not to sit there and listen to the opinions of man. Verse 16. He goes on to say, Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. This kind of talk spreads like cancer. As in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus, they've left the path of truth, claiming the resurrection of the dead has already occurred In this way, they turn some people away from the faith. Very tragic. This false teaching today is called amillennialism. It's the idea that the resurrection has already taken place, and now we're in the kingdom age, so to speak. You probably have no idea what amillennialism is, but the resurrection for the believer has not taken place for you. You will still be resurrected. You will still have your new body. It's still a future for us. But these people, they came to a false teaching, and their false teaching led other people away from the faith. You know what I find is kind of amusing? Is that though it was happening back then, it's happening today. I was in a conversation at a table with a universalist and a Mennonite elder, people from two different denominations, and they were much older than me. They were both, one was in his 60s and the other one was in his 70s. And I sat there and listened to them, and I was the young one, so I just wanted to hear them out. And through all their reasoning, they weren't using really scripture. They were just using their reasoning. They came up with that all people are going to go to heaven, even Satan, because God's going to make everyone believe in the end. Truth does not come from the ideas of men. Truth comes from scripture. You must know the scripture. And you know, the, the cool thing is, is you don't even need to know a lot. Simple truths of the Bible can do great things in our life. There was a woman who got saved, and she knew that she was saved by the grace of God, but she was married to a Mormon husband. And the Mormon husband not only knew the Bible very well, well, not the truth, just knew the Bible very well. He also knew the Mormon scriptures. And so she, he would always have that to stand back on. I know more than you, so, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. But she's like, no, I'm saved by grace. I, I'm saved by my faith in Jesus Christ. And she was unmovable in that. She rested in that truth. And over time, something started to take place because she had something that he could not produce. Even though he had all the works, he didn't have the life of God she did because she held on to the simple truth of faith in Jesus Christ eventually he started coming to church with her and got saved not because he knew all the false doctrines but because of that simple truth that she held on to it spoke to his heart because you can't produce the life of God apart from the truth of truth of God just because someone knows more false doctrine doesn't mean that they know more (laughs) 
If you know Jesus is Lord, if he's the object of your life, you're in a great place. Don't succumb to man's pride, man's ideas, or man's false doctrines. In Paul's day, as Paul was writing this, false teachers were going to suffer, excuse me, Paul says these, these false teachers, they're going to suffer greatly. In fact, he says, let them be an anathema in the Greek. Let them be cast to the lowest pits of hell. That's a, you're in a bad place if you're a false teacher in the church. That's not a good thing. So much so that James says, let not many of you become teachers knowing that you're going to receive the stricter judgment. Think about that. I would not want to be responsible for that. And yet I realize that I am a pastor. I'm a teacher of God's word. That's a huge burden upon my shoulder. I am responsible before the living God who searches my heart and my mind to teach the truth correctly. Because if I do not, I am going to suffer, suffer a, mar, a far worse punishment than the non-Christian. That is serious. I look out today in the church and I realize that there are many false teachers. I'm not as bold as Paul in naming them. I mean, Paul was an apostle, but they're out there and they're teaching false doctrine from the pulpits. And as t Paul said, they're teaching the simple-minded women and they're leading them astray from the truth. You know the Bible actually says that? In Second Tim well, in chapter 3, we'll get there. Teaching women, leading them astray from the truth. Scary. Verse 19, but God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription. I love this. It's a stone. It's standing firm, and it has this inscription on it. It says, the Lord knows those who are his, and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. This is the mark of the believer. How do we know we're of the truth? How do you know I'm a Christian? How do you know you're a Christian? By turning away from evil. In our culture, it's so easy to say we're Christians. I mean, you're practically born a Christian. People at some point in their life, everyone has gone to church at some point. 75% of our country says they're Christians. And 40 years ago, 90, 95% of our country said they were Christians. And if you go to the streets and you ask random people, do you know Jesus? They're going to say, yeah, I know who Jesus is. Everyone has a Bible somewhere in their home. Everyone's heard the gospel at some point in their lives. I mean, going to cities, there's a cross on every church. You know, there's churches everywhere. And if this is so widespread Christianity in this country, then why is evil prevailing? Because the mark of a Christian is departing from evil. Something's wrong. Why are alcohol sales so high? Why are there just as many bars, if not more bars, than churches? Why is pornography a $4 billion industry? And Jesus says, you have the chaff with the wheat. They're growing together. They look, they look alike in some ways, but they're very different. A diamond is a very precious gem. Very expensive. You buy an engagement ring? Man, I didn't have any idea. <laughs> I always wonder, though, like, why is a diamond so special? I mean, you could get a quartz, and they look exactly the same. And you get a bigger one. In fact, I remember uh, there was a friend in Idaho, and uh, I looked at his wife's engagement ring, and it was like this huge stone. And I was like, man, you must have really loved her. <laughs> He's like, it's not a diamond, it's a quartz. <laughs> like, wow, you didn't love her at all. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, to our eyes, a diamond and a quartz, we probably couldn't even tell the difference. But if you took that to a dealer and they inspected it, they have a list of certain signatures that a diamond has. And they would look at those signatures and they would be able to tell right away. They, that quartz does not have the signatures of a diamond, therefore it is not a diamond. But the same is true for Christianity. The Lord knows who are his. He knows the heart. But this is how you can know. If you're his, you will turn away from evil. You will turn away from evil. Christianity is not a religion. It's not a practice. You can't do certain rituals or go, go to church. That doesn't make you a Christian. It's a new life. If you are a Christian, there will be a pull in you to depart from evil. If God's spirit is within you, there will, will pull you away from sinful living. 
And even though we can still be tempted and we can be lured into sin, we're going to hate it. We're not going to be able to stay in our sin. Listen to what Paul says about those who have the Spirit of God within them. It says, I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil. Just just the opposite of what the spirit wants and if the spirit gives us and the spirit gives us desires that are opposite to what the sinful nature desires these two forces are constantly fighting each other so you're not free to carry out your good intentions but when you're directed by the spirit you're not under the obligation to the law of moses when you follow the desires of your sinful nature the results are very clear Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, fighting, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, and wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, just as I've told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not go to heaven. If you're living that kind of life, you're not going to heaven. I don't care what you say beforehand. If you're living that kind of life, you're not a Christian. Plain and simple. Why? Because the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Guys, you've got to think about this. If God's Spirit is in you, it's going to pull you away from your sinful habits. It's going to make you hate evil. If, God, if you say, I'm a Christian, and then you're living in sinful, evil habits, you're not a Christian. You're lying to yourself. You've been a slave to your own pride. And that is what Scripture says. That includes, guys, greed. It manifests itself in gambling, hatred, porn addictions, envy, drunkenness. And it's, it's, to me, it's pathetic to hear so-called Christians pronouncing judgment on homosexuals when they themselves are addicted to pornography. That's such an oxymoron. Yo, yeah, look at those homosexuals over there, and then they're watching porn. Like God doesn't, oh yeah, it's okay because the guy is looking at women, so I don't care. Guys, this is the truth. Both are not saved. There's some Christians that they think that only if their loved one stops drinking, then they're going to be okay. Stopping sinning is not what's going to save you. You need Jesus. Only Jesus can save you. If Jesus is in you, he means that he has placed his spirit within you. And if God's spirit is within you, then the next mark will be departing from evil. You will start pulling away from evil living. Greed, hatred, Sexual desire. Somehow we we think it's not really evil to pursue money. Or it's not really evil to hate people. Those Those are evil. Now, before you start condemning yourself, which, if you're really honest, you know your own nature. You know what you have found yourself prey to. In this body, our old nature is still there. And from time to time, we get caught up in a lust whether it's money or anger or sexual in nature. But as a Christian, we will never be okay in doing those things. God will convict you big time. You ever watched a movie, and it's just one of those movies that are kind of iffy, and once you watch it, you just feel gross, and you're like, why did we do that? You don't want to act like that because you don't want to seem weird, but you just knew that it was wrong to watch that. It just was not right. That's God's Spirit saying that's evil. If you can sit there and partake in evil and feel nothing you got a problem, and it's a Jesus problem. You need to be saved, and you can be saved by crying out and asking Jesus to come into your life. And when God's Spirit comes into your life, you will be changed. God's Spirit will live in you, and he will pull you from the evil. That is a signature of the Christian. You will depart from evil. We we think of Christianity as rituals and, and outward. Christianity is spirit. It's inward. Listen to Jesus, and let's get out of those fleshly impulses. Going on in verse 20, he continues this thought by saying, You know, in a wealthy home, there are some utensils that are made of gold and silver, and some that are made of wood and clay. 
The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourselves pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. Guys, there's always this big question is, is how far can you go into the world before you're not a Christian anymore? What, as a Christian, what can I get away with and still be a Christian? You know, can a Christian do this, and can I do this? How much can I drink? What kind of shows can I watch? How many times can I blow it? You know, those type of questions. If you're questioning what you can get away with and still be a Christian, you have the completely wrong heart. (laughs) We shouldn't be concerned with what we can do. We should be concerned with what Jesus wants us to do. And there's a difference. Instead of saying, Lord, can I do this? Say, or what can I do as a Christian? Can I do this? Say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? What does Jesus want for your life? Have you thought about that? I do know this for sure. I wouldn't want to gamble my eternal status because I'm addicted to pornography. I'm not going to come up short to be my place in heaven because i'm pursuing the american dream because i'm so focused in this life and making a name for myself that i'm going to come up short to the eternal glory i'm going to make sure that i'm there and i'm going to listen to what god wants for my life because i want to be there because i know that this world is temporary this world is not going to last but paul uses this example these, these vessels in the home And that there's different vessels, there's different plates, so to speak. When I was growing up, my mom had Tupperware and she had glass dishes. The Tupperware was used for the kids. The glass dishes was used for the adults. But then she had her grandmother's fine china. And that that stayed in the cabinet and that never came out. That only came out on these special occasions. Usually once a year, Christmas or Thanksgiving, when all the kids come home. But you see, church, the point is, and then what Paul is trying to show you, is that Jesus does want to use you. And he wants to use you even more than you may want to be used. And I hope you want to be used, but Jesus wants to use your life. And Jesus is not so interested in how much success you have in the world, how big your bank account is, what is the size of your 401k, how are you set up for your future. If you're thinking of just this life, you're thinking way too small. Jesus wants you to store up eternal riches. The 401k in heaven. The faithfulness that we confirm with our lives on earth will be translated into heavenly riches. What we do here on earth and our faithfulness to the Lord is going to be translated into heavenly riches. And I promise you one buck of eternal riches is far greater than all the money in this world. And another thing, I want you to listen. What we do for the Lord is directly correlated to how we're possessing this life of ours. What we do for the Lord is directly related to how we're possessing this life of ours. The kind of vessel you are is valued on your purity. Now think about that. What kind of vessel are you? Are you uh, a Tupperware? Are you fine china? That is dependent upon your holiness, your purity. If you're sold out for Jesus and this world has no value to you, you're dedicated to the Lord's work. Then you're golden. You're the fine china. If you're living in the world, one foot in the world, one foot in Jesus, you're the Tupperware. (laughs) You have no real value. You know, guys, one thing I, as we finish up here, one thing that's very sad is we all want the glory. I should say we all do. There's been seasons in my life that I want the glory. I want to see God use me. I want to see Jesus use my life for his purposes. I want to be used in great ways for the Lord. But I don't want to suffer the cost. I want the glory, but I don't want the cost. And when we look at the lives of Paul or Charles Spurgeon, Dwight L. Movie, David Livingstone, and even, I'm not sure if you know who Chuck Smith is, but he was, kind of started Calvary Chapel. 
And you see how God used these men in such great ways to really just touch the lives of millions of people. I always think, man, God, that would be so cool. But you see, nobody sees the cost. Nobody even considers the cost of what they had to go through before God could make them that. When you read the biographies of these men, you see the pain and the suffering for years and being faithful in just the small things. Just taking the small and saying, you know what, this is what God has given me. I'm just going to be faithful in that. I think of Chuck Smith. He was a, a pastor, well, he would say like, in the worldly sense, a failing pastor for 17 years. He had to work a full-time job just to pastor church for 17 years. He had to experience the death of his dad and his brother in a plane wreck. Things that would cause you to turn away from God. And he just was doing the mundane things for 17 years. And it's just so opposite to how we think. We dedicate, you know, five years to the Lord and expect to be the next Billy Graham. You know, God, I gave you five years. And why aren't I successful? Guys, if you're feeling called to be used by God, if, if Jesus is placing this burden on your heart to reach people with the love of Jesus, then you need to sanctify yourself from the world and be faithful in the small for years. Let other people go before you. Your time will come because God is working character in you through your suffering. I remember at Bible college, Every boy at Bible college was going to Bible college to be a pastor. I mean, that's what you did. You go to Bible college and you study because you want to go out and you want to be a pastor. And I remember talking to some of these other young men at the time, and they're sharing their calling, and they were sharing their vision and how God has called them. And then they were sharing how, you know, um, the relationships they had. You know, I came from so-and-so church, and I have this youth ministry position that's waiting for me as soon as I finish Bible college. And they're all talking about they have their whole lives set up of how they can hit the next step. I was, I actually personally felt I didn't have a chance. I almost wanted to just kind of like throw in the towel at that point. <laughs> I'm like, man, I don't have a big church. I don't have any position. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. But when I talk with them today, I know of only one out of 50 men that I talk with that is actually serving the Lord in ministry. One out of 50. That's not very good odds. What happened to the other 50? We all went to the same Bible college. We all took the same classes. We all claimed the same calling. Being faithful in the small language. Small, small, small things. Just being, being walked over. This being, you know, this is what my ministry is and that's okay. I, I was very naive um, as a young Christian because I didn't grow up in a church like most people do in the Midwest. Uh, my family was very rejected in churches and so we had home church and that in and of itself is very embarrassing. And... Um, I walked away from the Lord and I got into uh, drugs and alcohol. But when Jesus saved my life, I was just so excited that he saved me. I wasn't going looking for a position. In fact, when I got saved, I was just like, what can I do? I want to serve the Lord. And they're like, well, you can fill the communion cups every Sunday and pick up the sanctuary. I was like, sweet, I get to serve the Lord. I started doing that. And then I went to Bible college and I came by and I'm like, you know what? I'm called to be a pastor. and God's calling me to be a pastor, to be a teacher. He says, great, you can teach the five-year-olds. Taught the five-year-olds for five years. Taught the jail ministry for three and a half years. Nobody knew what I was doing. Well, people knew, but it wasn't a very notable position. The point was is it took 10 years before God called me here. 10 years. And you know, that's just so opposite to what we think. Guys, psalmist writes and says, promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west, but from the Lord. Give it time. Guys, if we commit our lives to Jesus and we set ourselves apart from the world and we just be faithful in the small, God's going to use you. That's what the point of Paul's saying this. If you just purify yourselves, if you just set yourselves apart for the Lord and just be pure from the world, God's going to use you. God will use you. Just be patient. A vessel of gold is one who sets his life apart from this world. And worldliness is not how you look outwardly. 
Worldliness is centered in covetousness, desiring the things in this world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those things are worldliness. And if we give up this world and we dedicate our life to the Lord and give him time, God in due time is going to use you. He will use you. Just be faithful. Give it more than a month. Give it more than a year. Give it more than five years. Give it more than 10 years, huh? How many of us can honestly say for 10 years I have been solely dedicated to the Lord, apart from this world, pursuing nothing of the world, only pursuing the Lord? We can't. Let's pursue the Lord and we can be a vessel of honor. Let's pray.